Good evening and welcome this evening. It's lovely to see you all tonight. A few verses from Romans. I was reading this this afternoon. And Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or, or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Thank you. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow, nothing, nothing can separate us. I don't know what your week has been like. We, we had a good time last Sunday. And I don't know what your week was like after last Sunday, but it's another Sunday now, and we've got another week to face. So let's stand, shall we? And we're going to sing, you are my vision. Whatever comes, he's our vision. He's what we've got. Would you like to stand? us that nothing can separate us from your love your love is always there no matter what we're going through we just have to make that choice to reach out to the one that loves us and father i pray that tonight however we feel we will reach out to you lord we thank you for the words you are my wisdom you are my true word i ever with you and you with me lord you're my great father and i'm your true child you dwell inside me. Together we're one. Father, I thank you that we're never alone. Sometimes we feel like we're alone, but the reality is you're there with us. And Father, I thank you that you're a God who is always there. I thank you that we can turn to you at any moment. I thank you that when we fail to understand all the stuff that goes on in this world, you remain solid, you remain the same. 
and you don't change. Father, may we reach out to you tonight.
the word was Jackie May the whole, raised the whole matter of being desperate again. And the other one, one of the songs is about touch. Um, we need your touch again or something. So the other talk that I was going to give is on, on prophecy in church. And I think that's something we could pick up sometime. It might just come in, but, uh, but we've read together from um, Luke chapter 8, so we better stick with that. I confess that I've got a real love of the series Heartbeat on television. I, uh, I probably missed the whole lot when they were on in the evenings, when they were first in, probably 1970s, anybody in 19... I don't know, so I didn't see them. But uh, they come on about five to six on a Sunday, on a, a weekday evening, and if there's nothing on the news, I switch between the news and when they have the adverts, but I fall in love with Heartbeat, and I just love it. It's, it's, it's a story centred on a police station in a, in a small uh, town in Yorkshire, and... Um, the, the thing about it is, though, it's a story, but there's a story within the story. And the, the story, the main story, is centers on the police station and what's gone wrong, what the police have to do. But on the side of that, there's a, a guy called, I can never remember their names, but uh, he's always into trying some scam of making money and up to no good and getting himself in problems. And that's the story. Sometimes there's even another story, but there's a story within a story. Second thing I want to introduce by saying is talking about crowds. Do you like being in crowds? I suppose if you're in a crowd of Christians, two or three thousand, it's really great. I think you probably were the other Wem at Wembley. Um, but there are some crowds and there are some crowds. I don't know if you've ever been to a football match. Um, I've been to Arsenal once or twice, even lately. But you now you're supposed to sit on your seat. You're not supposed to stand up, you know, and you're sitting on your seat and Arsenal score a goal and everyone, ah, you know, you say, sit down, I can't see. So you've got to stand up and be with the rest of them, otherwise you can't see what's going on. But crowds, I don't, I suppose some of you ladies may have done, you've been up to Harrods sales after Christmas and you saw that mink coat in, in the window, it was a thousand pounds and it's reduced to 50 and I must have it. I can see it on your faces, you must have it. And so you get up there at sort of 6 uh, p.m. On the, on the night before and you suddenly realise that's not going to be much good because they're already at the door. So you try and get to the door and you're waiting. There's probably about 100 people after that coat and you're waiting for the doors to open and the doors are, whoom, they all go in and they're, bang, you know, getting, getting you out of the way because they want that coat, but you want it. So you're pressing. Crowds, crowds can be difficult. Luke is a story within a story, Luke 8. The reading we've had, it's a, a story within a story. There's two stories here. It's a story within a story. You've got Jairus and his daughter who is dying, nearly dead. And you've got a woman, she's not even given a name. She's just a woman who turns up in the crowd. There's something common about this. The crowd, yes, but both of them had to press through the crowd to get to Jesus. The Bible says here that as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. It was one of those crowds. You know, some people don't like <clears throat> being shoved out of the way. You know, when, when they're in a crowd, they want to be, and if you try and get through, they're sort of closing the gap. But this crowd nearly crushed him. It wasn't easy. But both of them, in the crowd, wanted to get through and press through to Jesus. Do you remember blind Bartimaeus down at Jericho? Crowds of people in the street, and I guess he was sitting um, somewhere at the back, but he heard that Jesus was passing by, and he started to cry out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. And they said, shut up, get out, shut up, be quiet. But you know, Jesus had an ear and called the man, get, bring him here, bring him here. And he received his sight, tremendous. Or do you remember Zacchaeus, that very little man? And a very little man was he. Climbed into the, he couldn't see, he couldn't see over the crowd, so he didn't barge his way through. He climbed a tree to see to Jesus. These two, Jairus and the woman, what motivated them? Well, here's the word desperate. They were both desperate. They were both desperate to get to Jesus. They had problems. You've got a 12-year-old nearly at, at death's door. 
and you've got a woman who's, who's menstruated for 12 years long and spent most of her money, there's a footnote on the Bible, probably spent all her money trying to get healing and had run out of money. And they were both desperate people. They needed to get to Jesus. You know, desperate people will sometimes do the unexpected. Desperate people will sometimes do what they would never normally do. Some t but desperate people sometimes will go way outside their comfort zone because they're focusing on one thing. Their need and the fact, in this case, that Jesus Christ can help them. We have a friend, I'm well worried about this going on to the internet because Tom might hear it, I don't know. Tom Hamlin, very dear friend of ours, um, missionary, um, most of his life, active life, um, never went to college, didn't train as a missionary or as a pastor or anything like that. God just raises up some people and Tom is a unique sort of guy. And, um, and, and Edna, his lovely wife, and uh, he became an evangelist all sorts of things happened to him as an evangelist. But one day he was reading his scriptures and he saw that in Jesus there was something else that he hadn't got. Something more that he needed. It, something to do with God the Holy Spirit. He didn't know much about it. Never been to college. Hadn't learned it. But he knew from the scriptures there was something more. So what did Tom do? Well he shut himself in his bedroom for weeks. And didn't come out. His wife took him food up. I guess he went to the bathroom. But his, his wife took his food up. Uh, and for weeks he just lay before God, longing to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And I, I think it was weeks. If you're listening, Tom, or you hear this, you'll have to tell me again. Um, I've got all his testimonies at home on tape, but tremendous. And one day his wife was going up the stairs, I think, with her tea tray or a tray. With, and, and Tom walked out of this, this room where he was upstairs, and she dropped the tray clatter. She could see that there was a transformation in her Tom. And he got filled with the God, the Holy Spirit, and the stories of God's grace, a miraculous grace in his life. I've told you one or two of them before. Uh, but you know, uh, one day um, he was due to go to Saudi Arabia, I know I've told you this one, and uh, he, he was just preparing to go, and, and Edna, his wife, had been praying, she'd had a quiet time, she came down, and she said, dear Tom, darling, she always, they always call you to the darling, you know. And she said, I've just been praying, and the Lord told me that you're going to end up in prison in Saudi Arabia. Good prophetic word, isn't it? And then she said, but don't worry, the Lord's given me the scripture, and if you take the scripture with you, when you get into prison in Saudi Arabia, this scripture will somehow get you out. So off goes Tom to, to uh, Saudi Arabia, he'd been before. I don't know whether it was this trip, but he got all his Bibles got picked up in the airport. He got them picked up by the religious police. And um, he said, all, I don't know whether it was this occasion, but anyway, all the way around the room where he was, uh, you know, taken with all his Bibles, all these religious police were sitting around the room reading Bibles. They got all the Bibles, they were all reading their Bibles. But sure enough, he ended up in prison. Sure enough, that scripture got him out of prison. Remarkable things. That, that, and I could... You know, it just seems as he was that kind of miracle man, constantly experiencing God. But the thing is, he was desperate. I don't know whether I've told you my situation. I wasn't desperate in this case. I didn't even know how badly wounded I'd been. But um, I was moving on, about to move on from Doncaster to Hill in North Wales. And I had been really hurt in the, in the Doncaster church. Someone within weeks of me going there, and I was there five years, um, had said to me, look me in the eye, I'll never trust you, Ken. And somehow that went deep within me, and I, I wrestled for five years, and some amazing things happened in, in Doncaster, in Wheatley Park, but that seemed to have gone deeply within me. I didn't know how deeply that would hurt me. I went off to a minister's meeting in Lytham St. Anne's, and there were about 50, 60 Baptist ministers there. I probably knew two of them, so they, I didn't know them. And at the evening, the evening meeting, they started worshipping, and I sat right at the back, because I didn't know anybody, and I started crying, weeping. My, my eyes began to cry, and I didn't know what it was all about. I was ever so glad I was at the back. See, when you sit at the back, nobody knows what you're doing, you know can even hold hands with your girlfriend in the back. Actually, that's not true, by the way. The preacher's eyes naturally settle about six feet in front of the far wall. So, you know, beware. But um, anyway, the worship went on. Somebody preached. I don't know what they preached about. And then they got back to worship. And the, the guy leading the worship was just playing a guitar. And he had a bald head and he had 
hair right down his back. I didn't know him at the time. He didn't know me from Adam. And uh, they started worshipping, and they sang a song about uh, trusting God. Little, little chorus about trusting God. And then, you know, where you get a gap in a song sometimes, this guy had to put in another line, which wasn't there. And he said something like, because we trust you, you trust us. And suddenly, I just burst open with tears. And it was like a dam bursting, and it just came out of me like that. So what did I do? I got up from the back of this, this, this 50, 60 people, rushed down the middle aisle, threw my arms around this guy. He was more shocked than I was. Threw my arms around him, and I whacked my heart out. And uh, if, if you'd have asked me to have done that, I would never have done it in a million years. But somehow, when God began to work, it didn't matter about anybody else. And I think when we're desperate, we do what we would never normally do. What was their goal? What did Jairus and this woman want? They simply wanted to get as close to Jesus as they could because they felt that if they got close, they would get help. They would get what they needed. And, and so they pressed through the crowd. But you know, Jairus and this woman had to press through more than physical crowds of people. Let's just for a quick moment look. Jairus, leader of the local synagogue. A man of great respectability, a man known within the community, a man of considerable position and honor. You know the kind of man. Jairus, the head of the synagogue. <coughs> but Jairus was desperate. Even the Jewish authorities were at that time against Jesus. They, that, that opposition was building, building up amongst Jewish authorities. You know, pride can sometimes keep us from God. I don't need any help. I can manage on my own, thank you very much. Done it before. I'll press on. Status can sometimes get in the way. This whole matter of position. Or, I put it this way, what will people think? What will people say? I remember a guy who, who, who in, it was a high Anglican church in the States, they, they entered a phenomenal renewal, charismatic renewal. But the, the, the minister, to begin with, what God told him was to go out on the street corners and kneel down and pray. And I mean, it, 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 you know, it wasn't it had anything to do with the praying, it was just to humble him and bring him right down to where God could touch him and bless him. And bless him, he did it. He went out on the street, knelt down on the corner, a lot of people about, and prayed, you know. Um, but God had got him. And uh, religion can sometimes keep us from Jesus, from God. We don't do that in our church. Sure, you don't say that, but that kind of thing is dangerous. Can I say, I always test things. If I see things that are unusual and out of my experience, I'd, I want to test them by the Word of God. But you know, sometimes God does amazing things that are outside our experience. When I, I've told you before, I prayed with a guy in, in, in Hastings Day to be fat, filled with the Holy Spirit. He wanted to be baptized. From, so I laid my hands on Dennis and he started laughing. And I was disgusted. <laughs> laughing? I thought he'd speak in tongues. And he was just laugh, sitting there roaring with laughter. So I got him out of the room as quick as I could. I was so, you know, annoyed with Dennis. Um, He's been a Baptist pastor for years. He's got a phenomenal ministry in battle and a ministry in Nigeria. Um, quite remarkable ministry. And I read later in John Wesley's um, journals that he and Char Charles and John used to go out reading the Bible on Sunday afternoons and praying out in the fields. I can't remember which one of those. They started laughing. The other one was really upset, but he started laughing. You know, God... They were just filled with the Spirit. God does some unusual things. The, the point about this is, for Jairus, he was desperate enough to forget the lot. Pride, position, religion, a whole thing. He wanted help. And he wanted to get to Jesus. So he pressed through the crowd and he dropped at Jesus' feet. And you can imagine what people were saying. Jairus, isn't that disgusting? What does he think he's doing? He was desperate, but Jesus gave him hope. 
And then it all goes wrong. There's that woman. There's that woman. She stops the whole movement. You can imagine Jairus' frustration, anxiety, fear, delay. But this woman, just look at her for a moment. She was a woman. She's only a woman. Shouldn't have been there. Should have been at home. That's Jewish culture, not our culture. She should have been at home doing whatever women do. But much more than that, she was ceremonially unclean. She did not be in contact with anyone. That's according to Leviticus uh, 15. She should not have been there. Pressing, you know, people crouched. She was pressing through, so she was touching all sorts of people. But she should not have done that. Hence, later when she gets found out, she was fearful of getting found out, but she was desperate enough to push through that fear. But when she was found out and Jesus said, who touched me? She realizes she can't hide any longer and she falls at the feet of Jesus in public, as with Jairus. All this took place in public, as with this woman, and confessed what had happened. And she received her healing. Just notice this for a moment. They're in a crowd. They're pressing in. They're almost crushing Jesus. But just for a moment, there was a woman and Jesus alone in a crowd. You can imagine it. That for that woman, there, there was nobody there. It was Jesus and her. Her and Jesus. And sometimes when we really be worshipping God, and I think last week we sensed a little of that, there's a moment when it's just you and God. You and Jesus. The crowd's there, the congregation's there, people are around you. But I guess that's what happened with I, when I went forward and rushed down and surprised this worship leader. And it didn't happen all the time, but to probably, you know, rushing down. But, but it was just me and Jesus. God was doing something. And when that happens, friends, when it happens to you, run with it. Forget everybody else. And if God tells you to stand on your head, do it. I don't think he will. But do it. She was desperate. Love has time. Love has time for you. Love has time for you. Do you know that I love you? Do you know that I care? Do you know my love won't give up any time, anywhere? I'll always care for you. What is this? God won't give up. He won't give up on you. Because he loves you. So why struggle? Why let things like the crowd get in the way? Let's just quickly finish up with this and ju just say, you know, crowds exist today. And it's not crowds of people that, that we worry about. You know, when, we, when we're looking for revival, when we're looking for God to do something, when we're, yes, desperate for the, for the salvation of people in, the, in our village, in our town, and in within our families, when we're desperate, but, but there are crowds around that sometimes we've got to press through. Pride, yes. Status, yes. Fear, yes. If I gave myself to Jesus, if I did what that song said I should do, you know, what would happen? What would God do? So many people are fearful of God the Holy Spirit that they might be expected to do things that are outside their comfort zone. Friends, God is our Father. And he loves us. And he won't give up on us not going to do anything nasty, maybe unusual, maybe outside our comfort zone sometimes, but not always. Sometimes there's a crowd of disappointments we've got to press through. God didn't answer my prayers. God didn't do it. My friend Lynn, in, our friend Lynn in North Wales, she's going to have to press through a whole crowd of disappointment because God didn't heal David. 
and she's lost her second husband. Well, lost him. She knows where he's gone, but uh, he's not with her. Apathy. Sometimes I don't care much, quite honest with you. I come to church and I do my bit and sing the songs, go home and watch match of the day or whatever. Friends, God is looking for people who are desperate for his help. Maybe it's crowds of doubt and unbelief. I know some of you, and I was talking to one of some of our members in the week, you know, uh, you query my doctrine on creation, etc. You know, I, I love that, if people query. And if you believe something different from me, that's okay. As long as we both believe the Word of God is the inspired Word of God from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, whatever the last verse is. As long as we're really centered in on that. My concern actually is for those for whom science and doubt and, and others has destroyed their belief. They believe that the science has disproved the Bible, which is a load of rubbish. A load of rubbish. Friend Eric, who we go to Romania with, is a scientist, top-line scientist. Um, uh, developed the whole space thing about using, um, what do you call them, satellites for weather prediction and all of that. He had this idea of doing that, and he developed it all in Bristol University. Um, and he's written in his book um, that over 60%, at one time in America, not so long back, 60% of scientists were, were people of faith. They may not have been Christian faith, I can't guarantee because he didn't say, but people of faith. Ernest Lucas over there comes from the Brethren Movement. He believes the Bible to be, from beginning to end, the inspired word of God, but he's a scientist. And this whole idea that science has disproved the Bible is rubbish, but it's a big crowd for some people, especially out there, that, that somehow, you know... Uh, we need to press through that with people and help them through that. But people, time, even religion. Can, can I say, and I'm taking too much time to come to worship in a minute, you know, sometimes we've got to press through to Jesus. We are burdened for the world, and we should be, and we need to pray, and we pray for missions a lot. But we need to go beyond and press through. And sometimes that takes a little time. Because we want to touch Jesus. Because Jesus wants to touch us. Maybe we can't touch Jesus as the woman did in the crowd, touch the tassel on his garment. But you know, both of them received their answer, healing, resurrection in one case in the end, by faith. The touch of faith and the desperation of faith, the, the, the gyrus, but it was faith. And when we come to scripture, we may believe it to be the inspired word of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation. But when we bring our faith to it, then things change. We don't just read it, we believe it. And we come with faith. Communion. You know when you take that bit of bread and, that, and drink that, you have that little cup of wine, they're given to us as something to touch something to feel, something tangible in our hands and in our mouths to enable us to believe, to have faith, to touch Christ, for Christ to touch us by his spirit. Feed upon Christ by faith in your hearts. It's the old traditional words at communion. And I think we've lost some of that. We just do these things, but they're, they're, they're means of faith to enable us to communicate, to touch heaven. The laying on of hands or the anointing with oil. It's not necessary that these are special hands or that the oil is anything other than linseed oil, not linseed oil, olive oil. But, uh, you know, they're given you so that if you lay, someone lays hands on you, you've got something tangible, a connection, yes, with another person who loves Jesus, but through that tangible touch you come into contact 
with the living God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. I could go on, but friends, we need to press through. And I, that's why I'm preaching this tonight, because I feel that that's a theme that's going on within us, pressing through. Are we concerned enough? Are we desperate enough? Do we want it? Do we really want Jesus? Do we want his effective work in our lives and in this church? And I think we do. Sort of. Sort of, you know. None of us knows all that Jesus can do. In the darkest day, we can still hope in the unsearchable riches and all-sufficient grace and unconquerable power of God. And we live in desperate days. Things are horrendous around the world. God is still God, still on the throne, still unconquerable, his power, still his love is something from which we can never be separated if we're in Christ. Friends, I just encourage me. I'm not going to have a go at you. I'm going to have a go at me. We need to be a bit more desperate, a bit more on our knees, a bit more in prayer, maybe a lot more in prayer. I don't know. But friends, you know, God is still the same. And if these two can press through the crowd, by the grace of God, so can we. And whatever it is that keeps us from pressing through, then we need to push through it. Thank you, Father, for these two lovely people in Scripture. Jairus, the synagogue, respectable leader of the community, Lord, who just put it all aside and said, I want Jesus, I want to get there for the sake of my daughter. And this lovely woman, Lord, shouldn't have been there at all. And she too wanted you. Father, God has us to press through whatever crowd is keeping us.